Welcome and thank you for joining us today for the ninth installment of MotionSoft's eight-week technology summit. Our session today is titled Understanding the Fitness Technology Landscape. Your presenter today is Andrew Coleman, Director of Product Development, Console Technology, Johnson Health Tech. I'll introduce Andrew in just a moment. My name is Todd Tweedy. I'm based at MotionSoft's corporate office in Rockville, Maryland. I'll be your moderator for the series. The MotionSoft Technology Summit in this webinar series are made possible in part by our generous sponsors that include Matrix, Club OS, H2 Wellness, Visual Fitness Planner, and NetPulse. The summit, web the summit webinar education series is designed to support your professional development by giving you access to industry leading thinkers and companies that are driving innovation in the fitness arena. We only have three sessions remaining, and these sessions will cover how to drive high impact member experience management, legal considerations to be aware of in the personal health data arena, and finally on December 10th with Bill Besselman, the VP of Integration and Digital Strategy, we'll cover digital partnerships and specifically how to partner with Under Armour. It's a session you won't want to miss. You can review the complete webinar schedule by visiting motionsofttechnologysummit.com. I want to take this moment to keep you up to date on some of the activities taking place at MotionSoft and specifically our back office support services. As you may know, MotionSoft now provides 100% PCI certified full service billing solutions to complement our industry leading enterprise and small business club management applications. The MotionSoft full service solution leverages two best in breed solution, uh, resources. One is a full, a full service in-house team and an automated rules-based back office support service or BOSS technology. If you're interested in exploring full service billing or our standalone BOSS service, please contact your support representative by calling 1-800-829-4321 or by emailing support at motionsoft.net. Now, let's take a moment to ensure that everyone's familiar with the, web, uh, the webinar control panel and how to pose questions to your presenter today, Andrew Coleman. First, you should have a control panel on the right side of your screen, similar to the image that you're seeing here on this slide. If you don't see the control panel on your screen, look in your task bar for the orange clover icon and click it to open the control panel. You have the ability to submit questions during the webinar using the questions feature located near the bottom of the control panel. The question module is highlighted with a red circle in this presentation slide. Please take a moment now and practice sending a question via the interface. Try typing hello or how do I cook a turkey for Thanksgiving and then click the send button. Robbie, thank you. Appreciate that. Will, thank you. Jafar, much appreciated. All right, great. I think uh, we've got a good sense of uh, how to use the interface. And again, uh, at the conclusion of your presenter's session, uh, you'll have the chance to pose questions. This session is being recorded, uh, and at the conclusion of the session, uh, you'll have the chance to interface directly with your presenter. I want to remind you that we are recording the session, and your microphones are muted, but you will have the ability to ask questions, as we've just reviewed. After the webinar concludes, you'll be sent an email with a link to download the presentation, as well as this webinar recording. Now it's my privilege to introduce Andrew Coleman, Director of Product Development, Console Technology, Johnson Health Tech. Your presenter's topic for today is Understanding the Fitness Technology Landscape. Andrew Coleman currently serves as the Director of Product Development, Console Technology for Johnson Health Tech which is headquartered in Taiwan with its global marketing headquarters near Madison, Wisconsin. In this role, Andrew oversees all aspects of product development, strategic partnership management, and product strategy for technology products across all brands in the Johnson portfolio. Johnson Health Tech develops and manufactures a wide assortment of fitness equipment for both commercial and residential use. The company's products include treadmills, elliptical trainers, exercise bikes, and strength training equipment. The Johnson Health Tech brand portfolio includes Matrix, Vision, and Horizon Fitness. Previously, Andrew spent two years as senior product manager, console technology for Johnson, and five years as product manager, treadmills for Johnson in both the commercial and retail channels. 
Before that, Mr. Coleman spent nearly seven years in an engineering capacity working in various industries, including automotive and industrial hydraulics. Andrew earned his degree in marketing from Lakeland College in Sheboygan, Wisconsin. Andrew, welcome to the MotionSoft Technology Summit Series. It's a pleasure to have you here today with us. Thank you so Thank much, you Todd. So much, Todd. Uh, it's, it's great to be here. Um, definitely enjoy my involvement with, with both of the technology summits over the last two years and am uh, honored and, and feel privileged to be able to participate in the webinar series as well. Um, to, to add on to the uh, bio that Todd just shared with you, some of the highlights are here. Um, some of the little known facts about myself, obviously I spent a lot of time in the tech space now having uh, currently serving as the director of console tech, uh, but I do hold five patents uh, more on the mechanical side from, from my background in the engineering field back uh, years ago. And a, a, a recently broadcasted fun fact about myself is that I, I have two children with a third on the way. So um, the sleepless nights seem to never be ending and they won't be in any time in the near future. So enough about me and let's transition into what we're talking about here today. Uh, and I think today we're, we're talking about fitness technology and trends. We're really going back to the future, and I thought this was a, a, an appropriate theme given that it's it's now 2015. I'm sure a lot of you have heard on the news recently that it's the, the 30th anniversary of the movie Back to the Future. Um, and I think a lot of what we're going to be talking about today is is uh, is content that maybe not that long ago was seemingly outrageous or or the stuff of movie lore, and so I think it's an applicable uh, a slide. What we won't be talking about, hoverboards, as you see on the left, and as much as I love uh, the stainless steel DeLorean, we will not be covering any technology uh, having to do with uh, enabling time travel, flux capacitors, or anything to do with, with, with automobiles like that. So um, jumping into it, we're going to be going through some statistics to start with, um, all the while thinking about how does this pertain to your business? How can you leverage some of this information into what you can do today and where we're going tomorrow with the concept of what can you do to build a foundation for future-proofing your business and what can you do um, to, to think about how to extend beyond the reach of the folks that are coming into your facilities today. Um, for those that were at the Tech Summit back in, in uh, D.C. a month or so ago, you know, the panel that I participated in spoke to extending the reach beyond the four walls of the facility and I think this particular information that I'll, I'll, I'll be conveying today very aligned with that theme and, and when we tie it all together at the end it, you know I, I hope it paints a picture of kind of where things are going so let's talk about mobile applications to start with um, it's no surprise I think we hear about this in the news we hear about this when we talk with friends we see it on our phones I'm, I'm certain that many of us on the on the webinar today have smartphones and it's it's really not a shock that you know, Apple turned the world upside down in 2007 when they created the iPhone and then shortly thereafter opened up the idea of these app stores. And so when you think about it, there are, you know, a significant amount of apps available, but what's astonishing to me is that, you know, a recent uh, research study that was done as, as, as recently as, a, you know, last December, December of 2014, there are approximately 100,000 applications on the Android and iOS app stores that pertain to health and fitness. That is a staggering number when you th when you think about it. I mean, that's that's a, a lot of good uh, you know content that's available and a lot of bad content that's available. And so, you know, our job as industry experts is to help our customers wade through some of that. But the meaning behind this is that it's really, I mean, the stuff is pervasive. It's everywhere. Um, you can't pick up a magazine, a newspaper, or jump online without hearing something about mobile apps, especially in the health and fitness business. Um, today. But to put that in context, um, users that engage with mobile applications need to have a way to consume that content. And so um, typically that's done with phones and, and in a lot of cases tablets. And so to, to frame things out, you know, this particular study shows that 80% of the population now owns a smartphone. Um, that's really, really, really uh, amazing when you stop and think that Apple really jumped into this back in 2007. It's only been eight years ago. Um, when you look at the PC and laptop world, that's going back 30 plus years. The penetration relative to the smartphone side of the business is really, really awe-inspiring to see how quickly that's come up to speed. They're ubiquitous. I'm, and like I said, I'm certain everybody on the call or on the webinar has experience with or owns a smartphone. And 
you know, they're all over the place. They are the everywhere device these days. This stat to me um, is, a, is a little bit misleading. Yes, there might be seven Android phones for every iPhone, but what this doesn't really illustrate is that when you look at the iOS or Apple ecosystem, it's, it's a one-to-one -one situation. When you talk about the iPhone 6 or the iPhone 6 Plus, they're one and the same in terms of the software experience that you're getting. Your hardware may be a little bit different with a different screen size, but that software is what it is, and that software um, penetrates out through the Apple ecosystem. When you think about the Android side of the business, you have your Samsungs, your HTCs, your LGs, Motorola's, um, countless different handset manufacturers that will integrate the Android operating system onto their device. When they do that, they oftentimes will integrate that operating system and make changes to the experience to custom tailor it to what they feel the experience should be. So it isn't really a one-to-one, -one, uh, in my opinion, and I think it's a bit misleading because uh, the experience that I have on a Samsung device is different than what it is on an LG device, and those devices may not communicate very well, whereas when you pick up an iPhone, an iPad, a MacBook, you can create an ecosystem where everything communicates flawlessly. Now this, this statistic, um, probably not surprising, I am the biggest violator of, of what's on screen right now. We keep our, our phone within arm's reach 91% of the time. Not surprising at all. I would go so far as to say that uh, I, I'm not exaggerating for me personally when I say it's 100% it's, it's of the time. Um, it's one of those things where I believe as a society, and it's not just here in North America, it expands outwards, but you know, the, the, the connectivity that, that smartphones have brought to people and the, the ability to have on-demand, instant news, social, uh, statistic tracking for things such as steps taken, what I've eaten, um, it's really, when you get into that, some people kind of buck the system and turn and go the other way and want to be somewhat disconnected, but it really becomes one of those things where you know, having that connectivity option all the time fuels the desire to have it more. And so this is not at all surprising, and, and, and I'm, I'm certain that this uh, cuts across demographics and geographies as it seems to be a pretty consistent theme when I have discussions with customers. Now, transitioning more into the specific side of mobile health and fitness, um, Mobile Health News, which is a, a really nice publication that pertains to exactly what it sounds like, mobile health news. They do a lot of stuff relative to the medical side, fitness side, wellness side in terms of speaking to the technology side of that, uh, of all of those industries. Just two weeks ago published a report that, you know, 58% of smartphone users have downloaded a fitness or health app. That's astonishing because I've seen, uh, I've seen surveys done and research done that states that there are as many as 3 billion smartphones uh, in use globally today. And so putting that in perspective, uh, coupling it with the, the 100,000 different mobile apps that are available that pertain to health and fitness, it's a, it's a staggering number. It's a huge industry. It's a growing industry. And there's an opportunity to make a decent amount of money in that industry if you play your cards right. The one caveat that I will say is from personal experience, I have, if, if for those of you at the Tech Summit, I'm the guy that has 40 plus apps on his phone, um, thinking back to the icebreaker event that we did. But just going through it, I have, you know, 15, 16 different health tech apps on my phone. I use two of them predominantly. And I guess what I'm getting at there is that there's a lot of variety out there, and users, as I said before, um, need guidance from folks like us in the industry that talk about what's best in breed and what may be best suited for them and whatever they're trying to accomplish. Um, it, it, it really can be a noisy environment, but when you find what works for you, it becomes very habitual. It becomes a routine that people get into to really dig in and use these things. But again, there's a lot of noise out there, which is an opportunity for us in the industry to direct folks, direct our customers into what makes the most sense for them and what aligns best with our business. This, again, not surprising. There are more users of apps than there are attendees at health clubs. And when you look at the numbers, take MyFitnessPal as an example. This data is about a year old. 80 million registered users with MyFitnessPal alone, 52 to 53 million members of health clubs, according to IRSA's study last year. That is really, really, really amazing when you think about, number one, 
the penetration rate that these apps have, which we've talked about. But number two, think about the opportunity that that brings for us in the industry. Um, you know, these apps to me, the, this is an awakening. These are these are gateways for people to get into spaces in terms of tracking their fitness, tracking their nutrition, and, and really taking a step towards overall wellness and, and, and taking better care of themselves. It's a gateway for them to really start to understand what this is all about and our industry is all about, and hopefully we'll start to see a migration of those folks that, that may be newbies, that may be using this technology. The goal for us is to migrate them into our facilities in some way, shape, or form so that not only can we assist them on their journey, <clears throat> but we can be a part of that journey and hopefully, you know, better our business because of that journey. No surprise, this has been out for a while now. You know, the, the statistic here in terms of the number of, of, of app users in the millions outnumbering the health club users, this isn't lost on big business. Um, Under Armour spent a considerable amount of money, as shown on the slide, to purchase two, you know, two apps, MyFitnessPal and Endomondo. Endomondo, for those of you that don't know, is, is really popular in Europe. And so these two app acquisitions helped Under Armour extend their digital footprint, which, um, you know, obviously they made the purchase of Map My Fitness prior to this for, I think it was 100 to $130 million. When you put it all together, they by far and away have the biggest connected uh, environment with the, the, the deepest user base out of any of the of the companies out there. But when you stop and think about what Under Armour is doing, not only does this lend validity to kind of that connected technology, fitness, wellness space, but they effectively purchased, in, in MyFitnessPal as an example, they purchased 80 million eyeballs that they can now market to. So for Kevin Plank and Under Armour, this was a great business decision because he can now turn those apps into devices that have direct communication to the users. And these may be soccer moms, these may be newbies, these may be, may be fine-tuned athletes, may or may not use Under Armour uh, apparel or footwear, but from Kevin Plank's perspective and Under Armour's perspective, this is a captive audience that they can market to. And these acquisitions were, were something that he's come out and said, these were, these were done to obviously give them new marketing arenas. And so, it, you know, to me, that's, that's his side of the business. For me, it adds validity to the fact that this, this industry, the, the digital health, fitness, tech industry, it's not going away. It's only going to get bigger. And when you've got players like Under Armour jumping in after Nike's already been involved, it just, you know, it draws a stake in the ground and says, this is here to stay and we must kind of, we have to adapt our businesses to be relevant as it moves forward. You know, when you, when you stop and think about the penetration that, that these apps have, you know, and there's so many people jumping in, um, number one, the, the, the cost of entry is pretty minimal. Well, $2.99, $3.99, $4.99, $4 a lot of the apps are free, uh, and so people will engage with this, but they do it for a reason. You know, some people may do it because their friends said so. Other people may do it because they're intrinsically motivated to find a better way to maintain their health. What it really comes down to is most people are doing it for a reason. You know, a lot of it's goal tracking, it's awareness of health issues, it's motivation. Um, one of the things that's not listed here that I see a lot of is really the social aspect of it all. It's getting involved in these apps, it's getting involved in these communities, whether it's communities of people they know or communities of people that they don't know but they can relate to because they have similar goals, similar likes and dislikes, and they're all moving towards a similar, you know, objective. And, that social community provides the the support, the encouragement, the you know the, the fallback to go go discuss something with somebody, and it, it provides that motivation for people to jump in and really drive towards achieving those goals. And so, you know, these numbers are great. the The business opportunity is great. The impact on our industry is is there for sure, and we're all feeling it. But there's a reason why people are doing it, and, and, and that's really illustrated quite nicely right here. And it aligns with what I hear a lot when I talk to customers come through our building and when I pr participate in events like, you know, what MotionSoft staged out in D.C. a month ago. The really positive thing that's going on here is that 73% of these people say that they are healthier because of their app. Now, take a, take, take a minute to stop and think about that. If people are getting guidance from an application, that you know the overwhelming majority, three quarters of the people feel like they are healthier because of the information they're getting from the app, the guidance, the coaching, whatever it may be. 
think about the transition from what they're getting on that app and how much more impactful that would be if it went from being a digitized offering to being something that they were able to get within the four walls of your facility or maybe not within the four walls of your facility but through a service provided by your facility and so again for me going back to the concept of you know there, there's a lot of play in this space right now there's a lot of relevance in this space right now but it's not something that should, we, we should be looking at as man this is a threat to our business we should be looking at this as there's going to be a pull from this into our industry. There's going to be a pull from this into your specific business that's only going to help you know, drive membership engagement and give you opportunities to reach out to new members. And so I think as we're going through this, let's be thinking about what could this mean to you today? What can it mean to you tomorrow? And how do you use this technology to say, yes, you're getting great services through my fitness pal. But, but think about how much more meaningful that would be if you came into my facility and sat down and talked with a dietitian and a trainer. You're going to get that personal touch. And so I think, you know, don't look at this as a threat. Look at this as a definite positive and figure out how we can augment our businesses to align with where this stuff is going. This one is a little bit surprising to me um, because I, I guess mainly, you know, I think about the, the mobile devices and in, 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 in my sphere of influence and the people I know. You know, my wife likes to shop online. My wife's on Facebook all the time. And so when I see this statistic, it kind of, you know, it's, it's nice to see that, again, two-thirds to, to three-quarters of the people out there think that their health and fitness on their smartphone is more important than shopping and social media. That's great. Again, in, the, in my circle of influence and in, in the people that I know, that may not be the case, but I'm glad to see that in these studies that, that people are starting to see that there's more benefit to getting involved in some of the, the, the technology that's out there to better their lives versus, you know, reading Facebook all day or spending money. And so I just, I wish I could persuade my wife to spend, spend more time on this instead of, you know, spending money on Zulily or out on Facebook reading her friend's Facebook post. But that's neither here nor there. This is a nice transition. Um, we've talked a lot about mobile apps. But the other side of that business is, is wearables. And there's obviously kind of that meeting point where, where both groups kind of over, overlap and intersect. And so, um, you know, this study, 55% of health and fitness mobile app users will add wearables. Again, another anecdotal study that I've heard um, through different, different uh, research means that I've used is that when you stop and, and start to question people that have integrated technology into their fitness, health, and wellness program, those individuals use between four and six different apps or devices. And so when you stop and think about that, there aren't a lot of one-size-fits-all products out there today, and so it's not surprising that somebody's going to augment, you know, a Fitbit with my Fitness Pal or my Fitness Pal with a Fitbit so that you've got more granularity in what you're doing, which transitions us over to the wearables part of the presentation. So this, this category is, is as crazy, if not crazier than what's going on in the mobile app categories today. Um, it seems like every day I read about, hear about, get an email about, a text message about the next wearable that's coming out and how it's better and bigger and different than what's out there today. We obviously have, you know, the wearable categories, the, 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 the sport watches. You've got Connected clothing, which I think is something that's very interesting. Um, I haven't seen it done in a, in a scalable, cost-effective, non-intrusive way to the point where I think, yep, tomorrow I'm going to see these everywhere, but I believe we'll get there. We obviously have the Google Glass phenomenon, which, take it or leave it, it is what it is. Um, there are some applications there which make sense, but my favorite of all the wearables I've seen thus far is a wearable ring, um, and I've seen a couple different iterations on the wearable ring. I personally don't know that I need a ring to, to, to let me know that I have email or any other, you know, information. I'm good with a wedding ring. I don't even need that. I have a wife at home that's very good about reminding me that we're married and, and have been for a long time and we have kids together. So I look at the ring thing and I think maybe, maybe this has gone a little bit too far. That's my personal opinion. But who knows? Maybe as technology evolves, we'll find, you know, something uh, beneficial and usable in that space as well. Taking a step back and thinking about it, 10% of the U.S. population, 18 or older, now has 
some sort of an activity tracker. Now this study is two years old. You know, it would be interesting. I, I haven't been able to find any relevant data today. It would be interesting to see if that has changed as more trackers have come into the market. My guess is it's probably fairly steady at 10%, uh, just because, you know, the adoption. Um, you hear a lot of people that will get trackers, they'll wear them three months in, they're in, in their top dresser drawer because the wearables are nice. Uh, much like apps, they're kind of a gateway, they provide information, but the constant knock I hear on a lot of wearables is that the synthesis, the analysis, and the what does this all mean still isn't there. And that's, again, when we stop and think about our industry, that's where I think we can add value, whether it be through personal trainers, uh, coaches, people on your staff. I think when we can actually dig in and start to synthesize some of that data and make it make sense for users, that's when you can transcend the, okay, I've got something on my wrist that tells me how many steps I took to what does that really mean in my health and fitness journey. And I think, again, that's an opportunity for us to pull it all together and not fear the wearable or fear the app, but use it to leverage new membership, leverage, to use, you know, leverage it to, to, to drive more business. Now, looking at penetration of wearables across the population base, this, this statistic when I found it was very surprising to me. Um, you know, I see Fitbits, I see Jawbones on a lot of folks. Um, not going to lie, the majority of the people that I know that have them are in that 35 to 44 category or under. I was really shocked to see in this study such a good, you know, a decent penetration rate in the older demographic, which, you know, again, speaks to the fact that we have a lot of converging, you know, things happening, especially in the U.S. with healthcare changing, um, people are living longer, medicine is getting better, uh, but, but a lot of going back to the healthcare side, as, as, as we talked about at the summit, things are changing to the point where it's not just reactive. People are getting preventative and prescriptive with, you know, activity. Um, everybody's always understood that, that moving, eating better, it's really the key to, to making sure that we don't take on some of the diseases that, that have, uh, have hit our population base so hard. And we've shifted, and we, I shouldn't say we've shifted, we're shifting as a society more into that mode of medicine, you know, exercise as medicine is a good thing. And I think, you know, looking at these numbers tells me that my parents, the 73 plus year olds, my dad has a Samsung Gear 2 watch. He utilizes it for the technology that it brings because he has the awareness of what it does and how it plays into the discussions he has with his physician. And so it's really refreshing to see that this is, you know, the tech space isn't just limited towards the middle-aged and younger demographic, but it cuts across pretty nicely across everything. Now, one of my favorite slides, because I like to, I like to call out the, the first, you know, first two categories. When you look at the projected uh, shipment volume for smart wristbands and, you know, sports watches, Obviously, you've got, you know, diametrically opposing paths there where the, the smart wristbands are going to, 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 you know, die off in shipments or, or get smaller while sports watches are, are going to take an uptick. And, you know, I personally, until those sport watches get to the point where they're adding in some of that data synthesis and they're going beyond being a very expensive timepiece heart rate monitor pedometer that we have on the market today. I don't know why anybody would want to spend three to four hundred dollars when they can get very similar functionality for forty nine to ninety nine dollars in a Fitbit. And so until somebody, probably Apple, um, Samsung, one of those you know giants, jumps in and really comes out with a revolutionary product or a revolutionary upgrade to that sports watch category, I really challenge uh, this statistic, and, and I hope they prove me wrong, because if they do, that means that, that there are good things coming out, uh, but I just don't see it happening. Case in point, you look at Fitbit, again, same date as the, the uh, story came out relative to the 58% of you know, smartphone users have a fitness app downloaded. Fitbit has sold 30 million devices. This company has not been around that long, and they have sold 30 million devices total. That is staggering. Uh, considering that the, the sports wearable uh, industry didn't exist that long ago. So hats off to them, but again, this is another statistic that tells me um, these guys are here to stay, this, this category is here to stay, but I think 
What's more interesting to me is in the second paragraph, I'm not going to read it, I'll, I'll, I'll paraphrase. Since the launch of the Apple Watch, Fitbit has not noticed a demonstrable tick or impact on their sales, which reinforces kind of my assumptions. And I think as long as these groups like Fitbit continue to innovate until, until the sport watch category innovates or comes down in price, I just don't see that, that radical shift happening. Now, transitioning over, you know, we've obviously talked a lot about apps. We, we've talked about wearables. Now, the industry that we all play in, whether you own, maintain, manage, or a personal trainer in a health club or other, you know, commercial facility, there's, there's a big onslaught of connected fitness equipment. Obviously, I, I work with Matrix. I have for 12 years. Um, I'm not going to try to sell you any product on this webinar today. That's not what I'm here to do, which is why I didn't put anything up specific to our products. I, I just don't think that would be, this is an appropriate forum to do that. So when you take a look at really who's offering connected solutions today, it's us, it's life, it's techno, it's octane, it's everybody on some level. You know, I think even the, even the companies that maybe aren't there right now will be there shortly. Um, and it, it's really interesting because if you go into a lot of the big facilities out there, there's still a lot of LED non-connected solutions. But more and more in the last 12 months, I'd say, the discussion has changed when customers come to our facility. There's, there's an awareness uh, around the connected space. There is an interest around the connected space. You've got groups out there that are the, 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 the high velocity or you know, low cost providers um, or high volume, low cost providers that that are coming into neighborhoods that are that are causing a lot of facilities to stop and take notice and then reevaluate what they're doing on their on their floors and how can they make themselves different and that's prompted a lot of conversations around connected equipment and the ecosystem that we bring or that our competitors bring and what does it all mean and so you know at the end of the day we're all going to do similar things we're all trying to do them with our own spin on it. And so, you know, in the interest of not trying to sell Matrix above any of the others, I think that there are, you know, there are better products out there than others. That's my personal opinion. I won't name names. But I think there are a couple themes that, that you, you really need to stop and think about if you're going to get into connected fitness equipment in your facility. And then we'll wrap it up all, you know, here in, in just a little bit and, and get into questions. But when you stop and think about connected equipment, there, there are a lot of implications in terms of what that means to your facility beyond just, hey, I want to roll this piece of equipment in and it has the internet in it and, and what does that all mean? You have to think about your infrastructure. What do you have set up in your facility as it pertains to internet providers? Do you have enough internet bandwidth coming into your facility to support some of the content rich products that are available on the market today? If you do and you've checked that box, do you have Ethernet cable run to all of the product uh, placement locations on the floor? Chances are if you're an existing facility, maybe not. If you're a new facility, I always tell people if you're building a building, run the wire. You know, just, just get it done with. It'll give you flexibility. But you, you need to stop and think about that because that, that's a big implication in terms of cost. It can pretty, pretty quickly dictate one way or another which direction you go with product. And so when you're looking at these organizations, whether it's us or, or one of our competitors, work with a company that can meet you where you are. And what I mean by that is work with somebody that is going to come in and not dictate to you, hey, you need to tear your flooring up and run wires. If that's not where you want to go, work with an organization that's very comfortable providing you solutions that use Wi-Fi as a connected solution. Uh, conversely, work with a company that can go either way. I mean, you want that flexibility into the future, but I think it's it's extremely important when you're doing this, if you're going to make the investment, to do the diligence to make sure that you're partnering with somebody that, that really understands what you're looking for and can meet you where you are. Now, the other big discussion is around data. Uh, again, normally when I give these webinars, it's, it's very rich in terms of talking about what our products are and what they do. I've purposely left that out. But a lot of what we do, a lot of what our competitors do, a lot of what third parties like NetPulse do, it's all about data, whether it be providing workout tracking uh, platform services, um, you know, information about analytics. Uh, it's all data rich. But I think 
it's very important when you are working with a company that they understand what your data needs are and they share your vision on what the data data set should be. And so what I'm talking about there is, is that you shouldn't be forced to build silos within your facility that if you're going to put in XYZ's manufacturer uh, or XYZ manufacturer's equipment, you use this silo. And if you're going to put in this other manufacturer's equipment, they use this silo. It's really important for you to run a consistent uh, or run a program and run operations in your facilities with consistency and that are seamless. And so when you're working with these manufacturers, try to work with organizations that can communicate with each other on some level. And if you can't find organizations that are willing to communicate with each other, look to bridge the gap with a third party like a NetPulse. This is not a plug for a NetPulse, but you know they're doing a nice job of, of, of reaching out and connecting the dots between multiple manufacturers and kind of helping us manufacturers get out of our own way and then you know historically there's not a lot of, uh, of working that's being done in collaboration across manufacturers that pulse has stepped in and tried to fill that gap and so at the very least make certain that you have that level of compatibility uh, so that you can offer up a consistent singular seamless experience to members you know along those lines um, put a data migration plan in place and you know that might be the last thing you're thinking about when you're you're jumping in and looking at okay I want to go in and I want you know this equipment I want this workout tracking solution I want this prescriptive solution my trainers for my trainers to work with the last thing you might be thinking about is okay what happens three years from now when this lease is up if I decide to go with a different manufacturer you need to be thinking about that now because the last thing you want to do is get into a situation where you put a brand of equipment in they are a siloed brand of equipment and at the end of that three year run everything you've built up is basically obsolete because now you have a membership base that is comfortable familiar with and expects a certain experience if you opt to go a different direction from a hard goods perspective and don't have a software migration plan in place for your data you've basically put your members in a position where they're either going to have to start over relearn a new system or just be disappointed which is not good for you because that's the type of thing that could potentially lead to attrition so really think about a data migration plan when when you're going through these processes and lastly it kind of goes back into what I was talking about before partner with an organization that allows you to pull in multiple points of data under one umbrella you know I, we've just talked about a lot of statistics we've talked about apps we've talked about wearables the beauty of these devices and these technologies that are out there today is that they're all willing to approach the world in a uh, you know in a pretty uh, progressive standpoint compared to what our industry has been like in terms of they're willing to share their info they're willing to work with competitors they're willing to work with other other organizations in adjacent spaces so that you know they can push data and pull data from multiple multiple ports because the thought process there is that at the end of the day that data ultimately belongs to the person that has that Fitbit on their wrist or in the case of my fitness pal my nutrition goals my calorie goals for the day are mine they don't belong to my fitness pal they're mine and so when you're looking at putting something together in your facility look for tools that allow you to bring in multiple points of data look for tools that allow you to create a community look for solutions that really allow you to make your facility the focal point of that of, of your customers your members make make your facility and your brand the focal point of their health and wellness journey because there's nothing more powerful than you know sitting down with a member and saying yes I understand you're going on vacation next week but I see that you're wearing a Fitbit let's let's stay consistent and you know try to get X number of days of activity in and let's review it when you get back to have a tool that brings that all in and allows you to extend your reach transitions me to the next slide which is my concluding slide embrace the future the future really is now um, it's only going to continue to expand we have you know tremendous proliferation of apps wearables technology today in the club in the facility it continues to blossom and you're only going to see more of it whether it be from outside of our industry or from manufacturers and third parties within our industries we I can tell you constantly are working on our roadmap for tech for connected tech and I know the other manufacturers are doing the same thing and so embrace it really gravitate towards it because if you embrace it 
and you start thinking about it in a way that is really, how do I knock down the barriers of entry? How do I attract more people into my facility? How do I get access to that swath of people out there that have that 58% of people that have a health and fitness app on their phone? Or how do I access some of the 30 million Fitbit customers and get them to come into my facility? Better yet, how do I create new revenue streams that may not ever require that customer to actually walk into my facility and burden my facility with power usage, water usage, towel uses, et cetera? Think about the technology world in a way where you've got all these users out there in disparate communities. You have all of this data out there in disparate communities. Again, going back to what I talked about a moment ago, how do you create a singular community where your facility, your brand, is the single focal point of that customer's health and fitness journey? Doesn't matter if they use a Fitbit outside. Doesn't matter if they use Map My Fitness to track their nutrition. If you embrace the future and you think about ways to harness this all under one umbrella of a solution for you, you can attract those new members. You can create new revenue streams such as virtual memberships and services that reach beyond your four walls which ultimately lead to an improved bottom line and a, st a, stable uh, a stable platform for the future and beyond in terms of shifting your business to align with where tech's going today, where it's going to be tomorrow. You, you kind of think about it through these lenses, you'll set yourself up for success in the future. With that being said, I will uh, wrap it up and open it up for any questions. Definitely appreciate it. Andrew, thank you so much. A fascinating overview of the fitness technology landscape. Uh, attendees, this is your chance to pose questions to Andrew. Please use the question interface inside of the control panel to uh, pose your question. Let me kick things off, Andrew. And I'm, I'm curious, you know, we've, we've talked about apps, we've talked about wearables, we've talked about connected devices. What strategy are you recommending to your customers? I mean, how do they leverage all three effectively to get beyond the four walls? That's a great question, Todd. Um, you know, without giving up too much, you know, uh, without sounding like I'm pushing Matrix too much, what we're really trying to do is is speak to them in ways where we're we're sitting down and we're we're really looking at it from a partner perspective, and we're trying to be consultative. And so there have been customers that have come through our door that, that, that our sales reps feel like, yep, this is where I want them to go. Um, but, you know, five, ten minutes into the conversation, we realize, okay, maybe they're not ready for this yet. Maybe their facility is not ready for this yet. So our, our first approach is really to be consultative and, and not push um, and, and kind of let things come to them. The second thing is really going back to my, my, my summary in terms of, trying to find solutions that allow people to pull it all together. And what, what we're trying to do is really similar to what MotionSoft is, is doing, and that's we want to work with best in breed, and we want to be able to provide solutions from best in breed providers. And in some cases, if we have to, we will build bridges to connect these best in breed solutions so that you can kind of get everything under one umbrella. Uh, but for us, you know, we, we really want to put user-friendly, um, customer forward solutions in place that are, are done in ways where you don't need a, a, an electrical engineering degree to use these things. So it really comes down to understanding the customer, asking a lot of questions, and hopefully working with enough of the best in breed providers to kind of connect the dots for them so that, you know, it, it becomes less scary, it becomes more relevant to what their members are talking about today and, and really guiding them down a path to say, listen, you know, these are where your people are. Here are the statistics that prove it. Here are some tools that you can leverage to pull it all together under one umbrella that, that speaks to who you are and still contain some of the messaging and, and still have that relationship with your members even when they're not in the facility. And so for us, it's, it really comes down to that. We, we just want to build those bridges and help answer questions. Answer questions. No, good point. And, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, from our perspective, having an API strategy or application programming interface that allows us to connect with best of breed players like Matrix, I think, makes uh, the operation of facilities that are interested in uh, connected devices and wearables and applications a lot easier to implement. Um, again, attendees, this is your chance to interface with Andrew. I mean, 
if you want to talk uh, to an expert who's on the front line of you know, where we are with fitness tech, I mean, he's it. So please, I mean, this is your webinar. I really want to make sure we're getting your questions. And Andrew, I do have a question coming in from uh, Betty who asks, what apps and wearable devices would you recommend uh, for use with children, especially kids who are on a weight management program? Great question, Betty. Um, you know, when you look at that situation, the one that I keep going back to is is My Fitness Pal. Um, My Fitness Pal has some nice connected solutions out there. So in terms of being best in breed, they connect with a lot of different services. And so in our case, um, you know, our data will push directly into the My Fitness Pal platform. Uh, so there won't you know, no no manual entry required. But when you're talking about anything to do with weight management. I always go that direction because we know uh, that that nutrition plays such a key role in in so much of what we talk about that they they are by far and away uh, the best that I've seen, the best that I've used. I'm I, I'm an avid user of of my fitness pal myself. I I can't think of an application or a, or a situation where it, it I wouldn't recommend them uh, above anybody else just because I think. You know, there, there's some, some features there that, that, that allow you to dig deeper than just your calories that get into macros and things like that. I, I just think their solution is far superior to anything else that's out there. You know, we were talking before we started the webinar about uh, how fast this year has rolled by and, you know, the holiday seasons are uh, basically upon us. And, you know, for a lot of club operators and owners, uh, it's also, you know, kind of the finalization of their marketing plans for 2016. I'm, I'm curious what you've seen, and, I, and I've seen a couple of companies kind of stand out in terms of doing uh, online promotions within a network. And one example is Swift, which is a virtual uh, cycling uh, platform where you can compete against uh, other cyclists from around the world and ride different courses together and race. And they actually are doing advertising inside of Strava, which is a physical activity uh, tracking uh, platform for running and cycling. Is advertising maybe a good first step for some of these club owners and operators to uh, dip their toes in to maybe focus on uh, new member acquisition? Yeah, that's a, that's a unique that's approach. approach. Uh, you know, it's, you know, one, it's one of those things where I'm, I'm getting a little echo, Todd, just as an FYI. Um, I, I think it's one of those situations where that could potentially be a, a nice way to dip their toes into the area uh, of connected tech because you know, it potentially brings a return on their investment uh, in the short term, but it allows them to extend the reach uh, into into ways that they may be not have thought of. And so it's not something that we typically discuss with, with customers that come through our facility, but that could be a, a way for them to, to jump in with both feet and see where things go. Uh, certainly, certainly. Uh, Betty has a follow-up question, uh, appreciated your response, and was curious about trackers for kids. Uh, any recommendations or suggestions there? Ooh, that's a good one. Um, I personally haven't jumped into too much of that with, uh, with, with, with kids. Um, we don't reach down too deeply or we, we, we don't typically interface with customers that are catering directly to kids which is why I'm struggling a little bit with this but um, I would go personally with non-invasive technologies so you know things like a Fitbit are, are relatively non-invasive for an adult but what does that translate to on a child I don't know depending on on the size of the child uh, <laughs> I know that there are <coughs> excuse me I know that there are some um, versions that, that you clip on your hip, which may be more practical, um, a more practical solution for the child. But that's, I, I can't give you a great answer because I don't have too much experience in that space, but I would look for something that's non-invasive, that's not distracting, um, that would integrate in with something like a MyFitnessPal to create a holistic solution. Oh, thanks, Andrew. So let's talk about the customer experience for a second and their experience working with a connected device. And you know, certainly, you know, treadmills are, you know, a major attraction, I think, for fitness facilities. Uh, how is a member using a, a connected device? What's that experience like? Can you walk us through that? Yeah, no, no problem there. It's, it, it varies from user to user, um, but what we're seeing more of is, is a kind of a carryover of what somebody would do on a, uh, a smartphone in terms of the media content they may be consuming, the social media content they may be consuming. There seems to be more and more of a demand for 
that experience to be mirrored within the fitness console space. Um, we still see a lot of folks in facilities that get on our machines, they interface uh, with, with workout setups, and, they, and they're watching TV. Um, but we are having uh, a lot of conversations around, you know, very specific apps, very specific, you know, media solutions that are becoming almost hyper-targeted to different geographies around the world where people want access to what they might do on their phone or tablet. They don't want to bring their phone or tablet in. Um, if it's not that, they don't necessarily want to interface with a 5-inch screen if they can be interfacing with the same media on a 20-inch screen. And so for us, it's just very, very closely mimicking what's going on um, through, through you know, kind of the, the consumer electronics world, your Netflix, your Hulus, your Facebooks, your Twitters, things like that. But I think where, where, the, where the game is changing a little bit in terms of, of the connected cardio landscape is, is really it does come down to data, and it's, it's being able to identify yourself as a user and being able to get credit for that information that, um, that you generated during your workout and kind of being able to take that with you wherever you are. And it goes back into... Uh, the API play that we talked about. I mean, I, I can speak for us. Uh, when we work out on our equipment or when I work out on our equipment in the showroom, I'm able to, able to log in and identify myself. And as soon as my workout's done, that, you know, exercise data pushes into my fitness pal. It pushes across to map my fitness. And it allows me to kind of be transient with the data so I can go where um, I can go where I'm comfortable going and users can go where they're comfortable going. And so, there's a lot more of that going on, and I think you'll continue to see that um, cut across the industry. I think the days of, of siloed systems are numbered um, as it pertains to data, and I think that, that, that kind of what the wearables and apps have done relative to their API play has opened up users' eyes, and it's, it's going to force the hand of, of cardio manufacturers and equipment manufacturers to follow suit. So those are kind of the two big things. It's, it's really being able to take your data where you want and consuming the media that you want. Uh, thanks, Andrew. Uh, attendees, uh, we're getting down here to the uh, last few uh, minutes of your webinar, and I want to make sure that we're answering your questions. Please use the question interface inside of the control panel to pose your questions. Uh, and in the meantime, Andrew, while we're waiting for some more questions to come in, uh, maybe you know, going back to your summary of you know, kind of best practices, if you will, uh, in terms of you know, considering a uh, connected digital devices and the steps that uh, clubs need to think about as they're considering that whether or not to wire or not wire and so on. Yeah, I mean, that's, that, that's kind of the, the starting point that, that we kind of the way we approach things um, when we're talking to customers that want to get into the connected landscape is it, it's really that's the beginning for us and that's really understanding what what are your infrastructure you know requirements what are your limitations where are you at today um, we have very concise guidelines on what the requirements are for our products to perform to optimal levels within these facilities um, and it really is kind of a, a different dynamic um, Historically, there's a lot of influence from buyers uh, in, on the commercial side of the business where facility buyers will come in and they'll dictate purchasing uh, decisions, but we really need to see that that, that that needs to expand to be a team, and that's the other thing that we stress to our customers is that while the fitness buyer is, is, is engaged with what the solution is they're trying to create for their members, they need to engage with other people on their staff to make sure that all of the functions within the organization are pulling in the same direction because it really needs to be a team discussion. And so, you know, we may have salespeople bring customers in that they have the relationship with, and while they're talking about financing or, or, or different things along those lines, me and my team may, may be having a discussion with an IT person, a CTO, a VP of, 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 of tech to really talk about the integration points and understanding, you know, what's required and how can we meet them in the middle and, and make it all make sense. And so what it comes down to then is that if we get the infrastructure piece in place, it's no different than any, any other installer. We'll wheel the product in, set it up, and you're good to go. Gotcha. Uh, I have a question from Nick. Have you seen any stats or trends that indicate directly how important a facility is having connected equipment will be in a person's decision to join a facility? 
Great question, Nick, and unfortunately I have not. Um, I, I hope that in the future, whether it be an URSA uh, survey or an EH, EHFA survey over in Europe, I really like to see those statistics because, as I alluded to anecdotally, it's becoming much more important to the, the groups that we're seeing. Um, I think you, you've got your high volume, low cost facilities that are coming in and as I said before, they're, they're going into these neighborhoods and they're putting boxes up all over the place. It's making it difficult for the regionals and the smaller chains, the YMCAs, to, to compete on an even to even basis because you know, you sometimes your membership due situation is drastically different. So I've seen a lot of customers come through that have really switched the discussion in, in, into saying, this is how I'm going to differentiate help me get there. And so unfortunately I don't have that, I don't have concrete info for you. I'm hoping that that's something that comes out in the not too distant future. But anecdotally, very, very, uh, very important. Very important. Andrew, we're almost out of time. I wanted to give you a chance to you know, kind of uh, sum up your uh, thoughts today uh, and give our uh, attendees some, uh, some takeaways. You know, I think it's great that, that, we're having webinars like this. I think it speaks to the fact that, you know, in a very short time frame, we've gone from um, tech being something that was something that manufacturers dabbled in, health clubs dabbled in, to it's be becoming much more mainstream. And I think, again, going back to, to the tech summit that MotionSoft puts on, you know, thanks for letting us be a part of it. Um, you know, to see that so many of these large facilities are, are actually staffing at the CTO and CIO levels speaks to the fact that our industry is progressing in the in the in maturing in a way that uh, that 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 is really I think healthy for for the customer. And so at the end of the day, it's not lost on us that it really comes down to providing a great experience to the the members, to to you guys, our customers. And so um, you know I think the biggest thing is to keep your feedback flowing to the partners that you work with. Um, get more more folks involved from an organizational level to make sure that when these buying decisions are made, uh, they're being made across functions so that all, all needs and wants are met and that have fun with it. I think the biggest thing is so many people look at, at this space and they get freaked out when they start looking at the staggering numbers. They get freaked out and thinking about the complexity of linking it all together and and at the end of the day, it's 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 really exciting. It's fun. It can open up new new arenas for us. I think collectively as an industry, we we we're growing and we're learning together. We may have some missteps here and there, but at the end of the day, let's remember what it's all about. And that's let's getting people active, getting them into your facilities, improving your bottom line, and and have fun while doing it. Hey Andrew, you know, thank you so much for taking time today to join us. And again, thank you to. Johnson Health Tech and Matrix for your continued sponsorship of the MotionSoft Technology Summit. Uh, attendees, we're going to be taking next week off. It's Thanksgiving, believe it or not. So we'll be coming back on Tuesday, December 1st with Sid Banerjee, the CEO of ClaraBridge, to talk about high-impact member experience programs. Uh, it's part of our member experience management track. And then followed uh, by... Uh, Tuesday, December 8th with Jill Thorpe, who's a partner in the healthcare division at Manet Phillips and Phillips. And then again on December 10th uh, with Bill Besselman, the VP of integration uh, and digital strategy at Under Armour. Uh, thank you again for joining us today for this session on fitness technology, uh, understanding the fitness technology landscape. My name is Todd Tweedy. This will conclude our webinar for today. Thank you.